Make it a little bit more noise and please welcome to the stage the wonderful Miss Sinead Burke. Hello. My first joke was going to be uh, the height of the microphone, but that's not going to work now. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. My first thing, I need a bit of help. Finish the sentence. On will kiadagum. For our visitors from out of town, can anybody explain what that means? Can I go to the toilet? And it is usually the one opportunity within a primary school classroom in which children get to have a say. Which is ironic in a sense that my PhD is on the rights of children and giving children a say about matters that affect them in school. They have a right and teachers have a legal mandate to do so. And I suppose my interest in this field came about from two particular moments and experiences in my own primary school education. The first one, to be specific, was on the 19th of September, 1994. I walked into a group of 30 strangers, pronounced myself very deliberately in the middle of the room and said, hello, my name is Sinead Burke. I have a chondroplasia, A-C-H-O-N-D-R-O-P-L-A-S-I-A, -A -A, and I'm four years of age. I didn't have many friends in primary school. <laughs> And that was probably why. But one of the key moments in that whole thing was that nobody ever said on that first day, really? You're going to be a primary school teacher? How's that going to work? The children very kindly nodded along. And the adult said, if that's something you want to do, go ahead and do it. There was no disability access scheme within education at the time. There is now, thankfully. So our teacher diversity is getting a little bit better. But it brings about the most interesting moments within the classroom when you are a teacher at this size. I like to think that I'm Ireland's smallest teacher. I have not yet done the science, but if anybody in the room who is an academic would like to do so, I'd quite like that tag. I was teaching junior infants, and two particular moments stand out for me. You walk into the classroom, and within 30 seconds, one boy has his hand up. Why are you so small? <laughs> Irrelevant question. Now, bear with me for a second, because uh, junior infants don't really understand that uh, gender is a social construct, nor is it a spectrum. So my response usually differs. Number one, it's either, well, why are you a boy and not a girl? And immediately, if he is male, he has already adhered to the tropes of masculinity at four, and he is offended at the idea of being female. <laughs> and he says, I don't know. Or I'd ask, well, why are you so tall? And again, the response is, oh, I don't know. And I'd say, well, he'd say, I was born like this. And my response is always, well, so was I. And he'd say, okay, what page are we on? <laughs> I'm like, it's page four, tick the boxes, color it in, inside the lines, good man yourself. <laughs> Do they listen? No. <laughs> well, one of the key things about student voice is that where in which the voices and children are held within the curriculum. And one of the biggest difficulties about curriculum is that it's designed by people who think that they know best and who often don't consider the needs of the children in the room. I was teaching six class boys in a place not far from this very location. And the difficulty was their experiences were never considered. So for example, we learned about farm animals, sheep, cows, horses, which were very scarily referenced earlier. <laughs> Thank you, Oshin. I won't sleep tonight. But yet my boys had never seen a cow or a sheep. They didn't know what it physically looked like unless they'd been to a farm in Dublin Zoo. It wasn't in their locality. But yet when we spoke about different types of homes, we spoke about semi-detached and terrace and bungalow. The word flat was never used. So as part of my teaching, I used to do my very breast, best, not breast, that would be, <laughs> definitely get my uh, qualification taken away from me and possibly end up on a list. <laughs> I tried to bring the outside environment into my classroom. And one of the things that I used to use to teach was a local takeaway menu. I would stand at the top of the room and narrate the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And they would look at me at three, five inches tall and go, where is she going with this? <laughs> and I would tell them that Snow White was taking Prince Charming out on a date. And she had left 60 euro for us to buy the dinner that evening. Now, with the seven dwarfs, it's quite difficult because one is a paleo, one is gluten-free, and they're men, so they can't have the same food or there will be a fuss. 
So it was our job to try and get the most amount of food for the least amount of money possible. As a teacher, it gave me an opportunity to set those who are academically able on task and to do it independently. It gave them autonomy, which is one of the key principles of student voice. But as a teacher, it gave me time and space to sit with those who academically weren't very able or not as able. And I was sitting with one boy whose literacy skills at 12 would have been what we expect of a four or five year old. We were calculating the amount of money for chips. And he said, well, one bag of chips is, is 250, so two bags is a fiver. As a teacher, I was delighted with myself. I was writing down 2.50 multiplied by two equals five. This is maths, look, maths. There's my goals and objectives met. He looked at me like I was bananas. He said, maths? That's not maths. That's dinner. <laughs> Which, for the second time tonight, my teaching qualification probably should have been taken away from me. But those voices need to be heard. The second moment in which my own experience as a student really impacted upon my belief and passion for student voice was when I was a secondary school student. I did okay in my junior cert in English, but was very much resigned to the fact that it was not my subject. It wasn't something I was going to do well in, it was just something that I had to do to fill the time. But halfway through fifth year, a new teacher arrived into the building. And I tell you no lie, this woman dressed up for school. One day she would wear a ball gown. <laughs> the next she would wear a tuxedo. If you met her on the weekend, you'd, like, you'd pass her by because she didn't dress up for the weekend, it was purely just for school. And she turned to us one day and said, what do you just want to do? Now, I don't know if anybody's done the English Leaving Cert Honours curriculum, but it's quite heavy with Othello and poetry, and you have to do one female poet because that will always come up, <laughs> even though there's actually no rule or science to that. <laughs> and we said, we'd love to learn a few words, a bit of language. So she taught us vocabulary. And the idea that improving your language and vocabulary is powerful is something that really stuck with me. So it's something that I tried to do with fifth class girls who I was teaching in a disadvantaged area. I tried to teach them lots of different words every single day that kind of made them step outside of their comfort zone. One of my favorite words was jaunt. Does anybody know what jaunt means? What does it mean? Yeah, oh, that's very decadent. <laughs> A pony trap ride down the country. Uh, that's not how I explained it, but I wish I did. So that was one of the words that we used. And in the middle of... An art lesson, I believe it was. One of the children and one of the young girls who demonstrates some of the most difficult behavior stood up in the middle of the room and roared, Michelle, will you give a jaunt of your crayon? <laughs> As a teacher, my immediate reaction was to reprimand the behavior. But I was also so proud that she had used the correct word. It was incredible. And this idea of language being important is something that's fundamental to my being, both as a, an academic and a researcher, but also my personal skills. I was teaching sixth class boys, it was a summer day, probably about three years ago at this time of year. My classroom door was open and there was a boy standing outside of my room who from speaking with him, you would know that he had special needs or needs that were different to our own. One of the boys in my class stood up quite loudly, pointed and said, he's a weirdo. Now me being me, I couldn't let that go. And I said, that's an interesting word, weirdo. What does it mean? And they looked at me and went, you know, weird. And that wasn't really good enough for me. So I did the awful thing that teachers always do and said, let's look it up. 12 year old boys do not play along with that game. But we did it anyway. And beside the word said abnormal. And as a teacher and as somebody who could be described as abnormal by society, I was really upset that we were using that word to identify another person in our school. And I said, well, what does normal mean anyway? And they said, you know, normal. And I said, well, being normal for you boys is, you know, being 11 to 12 years of age, living in the inner city in Dublin, and wearing a uniform to school. If you're all normal, what does that make me? Now, I did not think ahead. <laughs> it was something that I thought would be a great idea prior to speaking because I had just asked 30 young men to call me a name. And young men in particular get an awful rap. They're in the media or they're spoken about or you cross the street to avoid them because they have a certain look. And I deliberately just positioned myself at the top of a room with a spotlight on me and asked them to call me whatever came into their head. It took a long time for them to come up with a word. I imagine they were initially thinking, what does she want me to say? But at the end, one of the quieter boys put up his hand and he said, don't worry, Miss Burke, you're not a weirdo. <laughs> you're just different. And I was never more proud than to be different in that very moment. 
The work of Student Voice is all-encompassing. One of the biggest challenges that we face is giving children the respect that they deserve. Not only that they deserve, but they have a right to. I would totally recommend that you spend the next few days listening to children. They will make you laugh, they will make you think, and they will change the whole way you view the world. Thanks a million. Shanine Burke, everybody!